Welcome back to Everything EOS, the longest running EOS podcast. If you're joining us again, thank you so much for coming back. But if you're here for the first time, please remember to subscribe for all the latest news when it comes to EOS. We have some exciting news to start it off with. A huge congratulations to the EOS oh, yeah. community on passing the EOS user agreement. That's right, Zach. I had uh, oh, yeah. what, last Friday? Yeah, so we, we had to record last Wednesday because I, I went uh, uh, to San Fran and traveled the next couple of days. And we we, yeah. we, we we learned from our mistakes of the past. And at last week when we recorded, the EOS user agreement just needed one more vote to reach the critical 15 out of 21 of the uh, active block producers to uh, enact what is essentially a replacement for the original constitution on the EOS main net. So exactly. as, as a block producer, why don't you explain to everyone what is different about the EOS user agreement from how things were before it passed, because it's actually not different at all. Yeah, so the, the biggest difference right here is that the EOS constitution, the interim placeholder constitution, was actually not voted in by anybody. None of the token holders voted it in, none of the block producers voted it in. It was just kind of put there as a placeholder in the early days when the mainnet went live. And part of what that included was things like giving power to ECAF, that centralized organization to change people's keys and help people recover their accounts that clearly the community did not like and express that. Um, but what the EUA also does in removing that EOS constitution and removing ECAF and a lot of these other things is it also gives more protections to token holders. So no longer can anyone come in and change keys on your account, even though in the past it was hypothetical. Now it's explicit in that EOS user agreement that it will not happen. There is no ECAF, there is no arbitration body sort of governing over these accounts. So ultimately it's a very good thing for the chain. Not only does it prove that whole referendum system of people voting for something and then having the block producers implement it, but it also gives more protections to you, the token holder. So that's something that I'm super excited about. I'm excited about a few other things too. So we just uh, enacted the referendum tool uh, yeah. at the beginning of 2018. It was a huge accomplishment. Um, but as with everything uh, since the launch of the main net, we, we, things don't always uh, happen the way we plan them to. So uh, voter participation uh, did not meet uh, the expectations that, that we set prior to the main net even launching all the way back last June. So according to the interim constitution that we've been following up until uh, last week, um, the referendum required a 15% participation on any uh, referenda before uh, the block producers would take action to um, activate uh, whatever the referendum was on chain. So exactly. th there were several referendums that had like 99% majority votes. So it was very clear that the token holders had spoken, but by the letter of the interim constitution, uh, it wasn't, so nothing could be activated without that 15%. So I, I think the exactly. highest, what was the highest and percentage we were seeing before? Like three or four percent? This was, this was one that uh, I think the highest percent we got on this was was two, three, four percent, something like that of the total billion tokens. So still a huge amount of tokens, huge amount of people coming out and voting. And this was one, like you mentioned, that did get 99 percent plus approval of 99 percent of people that voted for the EOS user agreement said, yes, give it to me. I want it. Get rid of that old constitution. Let's put a user agreement in place instead. That's simple. It's clear and it's enforceable, most importantly. So now that's here. Governance on EOS is working, as we can see through the referendum system and through the block producer approval system. So very cool to see all that in action. And now it looks like we may actually be getting a, another system oh, through yeah. that same referendum and approval process. And uh, when what is that, Rex? When, yeah, Rex. when Rex? When Rex? When very is it? Very soon. Coming at you very, very soon. As of this recording, right now it's Wednesday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We're looking at one more approval from a top 21 BP on step one of Rex. And then there's two more steps after that. Step two needs about seven more votes, but uh, it's all happening. So maybe by the time you're watching this, Rex is actually live. So that that is what is important here. So instead of before where we are saying, hey, token holders, please vote with your tokens. We're asking you to pull them off exchanges, stake them if you're not already staking, and vote if you're not already voting. And we, we are trying to get to this 15% threshold, which we hope we get there eventually. Like We want voter participation to go up, but innovation dies whenever you stand still. Like Absolutely. This new EOS user agreement allows 15 out of the 21 block producers, if they can come to an agreement on a referendum, then it passes and it gets uh, activated on chain. So instead of 
referendum still a tool because it's still an indicator and we will see like high majority votes. I, I can't see 1521 signing any referendum without a very high majority like the 99% we saw with the Rex. Um, but what's cool now is there, there's tools, uh, there's a tool on EOS Titan and I think a few other sites where the block producers themselves, when there's an active referendum, they will signal whether or not they support that referendum. So in the case of the Rex, they will signal, yes, I will activate the Rex or no, I will not. And then us as voters, this is a liquid democracy. We decide if, if a block producer is not signaling the way that we want them to, that we could vote for an alternative block producer using our own uh, token holder uh, voting based on our stake. So that, that's a huge difference. We, like you said, we should have Rex very soon. So I just want to congratulate everyone in the EOS community. This is a big, big accomplishment because the Absolutely. original constitution was not even uh, like agreed upon. It was just interim. We finally have an agreement that everyone could follow the rules on. And the best part is it's the same rules we've already been following. It's just, um, I guess, how, how would you say it? It's... Um, it's more clearly defined now and, and everything's enforceable and it also takes out the parts that were unenforceable and that people didn't like, like ECAF. So now that's officially gone, it's two birds, one stone and uh, awesome to see it get, get passed. But of course we have to mention EOS New York, they've been championing, championing this EOS user agreement. It was really them that came out with the idea, moving away from the term constitution into a user agreement. It's more friendly, it makes more sense, it's enforceable. So a huge shout out to the entire EOS New York team for making that happen. And uh, a shout out to the EOS Authority team as well for making this Rex proposal happen and really keep us all on track. So hopefully that gets approved. But speaking of EOS New York, uh, they actually just came out with a recent article, a proposal to further decentralize token contracts on EOS. So I want to break it down. And if I'm not mistaken, this is similar to a previous proposal that they already put out. Is that right, Zach? Yeah. So it has, it has a couple different components to it. I, I, I'm not sure of the um, token component, which you'll be better to explain that, but the, yeah. it, it, it involves um, a funding mechanism to, to fund community development. If, if anyone's been around since prior to the mainnet, you might recall something called a worker proposal system. And what that was meant to do was it was meant to support funding for community projects that don't have an expectation of revenue. Um, a good example of that would be the referendum tool, which EOS New York, out of their own pocket, basically funded a lot of that development, among other teams. Uh, but they, they were the EOS clear, Canada. Clear, did I? What, who did I say? You said New York. Yeah, EOS Ooh. Canada on the referendum, EOS New York on the user agreement, EOS Authority on uh, Rex mostly. G giving these New York guys too much credit, man. Just, <laughs> just, just, just kidding. They're, they're basically the thought leaders on, on governance issues, it seems like. They're positioning That's themselves fun. as thought leaders. And usually their ideas are pretty good. So do you want to explain uh, the, the, the um, multi-sig yeah. like token lockup and how it is now compared to how it would be if this were to pass? Yeah, so right now, anytime you have a token in your EOS account, um, let's use a, a POS token, for example. If I have that POS token, that POS token actually lives in its very own smart contract. And that smart contract says things like the total supply, the inflation rate, all of the core pieces of information about that token and sort of governs the whole token process. Allows you to make new tokens if that's an option in your smart contract and so much more. But the problem with a lot of these token smart contracts is that they're controlled by just one key. So somebody in the team or maybe multiple people in the team share access to that key. And essentially, if somebody, a hacker or somebody else that's not supposed to have access to it, gets a hold of that single key, they can do a lot of harm to that actual token ecosystem. They can do things like print more tokens, change the supply, do anything that they can do within that contract if they get a hold of that key. So what EOS New York is proposing, and this is actually very logical, is to, over time, as ADAPT gets more users, gets more traction, as the token economics sort of are fleshed out, to further decentralize control of that smart contract. And the way that they're proposing it is actually giving up control of your token smart contract, not the smart contract that runs your business or the operations on your website, but just the actual token smart contract and giving control of that to the system or the block producers in this case. So POS actually has this plan as well. And I do have to say, I, I own POS. We all do. We got it in an airdrop. Um, you have to POS April 25th plans. to claim it. <laughs> Yeah, April 25th Let's throw that claim. reminder. You just got to send a POS transaction to anybody. So you can send it to rob.vr, send the smallest amount of dust. You can send it to the POS token, send it to, your, send it to yourself with another account, and it'll exactly. activate it on both the receiver and the sender's account. So exactly. con continue but with essentially, POS. 
Yeah, what they're doing is they have plans to do just this, to decentralize control of the token smart contract once the platform is proven, once it works later this year, and basically give up control of that so that it is a truly decentralized system. And EOS New York is proposing that we encourage other dApps to do it. So you could see people like Dice doing it in the future, people like Everipedia with IQ doing this in the future, and just decentralizing control of that a little bit so that it's only up to the actual overall system, the token holders and the block producers, to make a change to a token contract in the event that they needed to. But really the idea here is that once a token exists, once it's out there, once it's being used in an ecosystem, that you really shouldn't need to make changes to it and kind of give up control of that smart contract so that you remove that central point of failure. Um, so it, it's That's a good true. recommendation, something they've put out before, but now in sort of a more cohesive approach that outlines the steps necessary for ADAPT to decentralize that token contract. So one thing I do want to mention is that this is not the only way to decentralize your token smart contract. You can also just set up a multi-sig among the members of your team or among the members of your DAC if you create a DAC for your DAP. You don't have to give up control to the block producers. This is just one way of many to decentralize your token smart contract. But the funding system here is kind of interesting. So in the same way that you can buy and bid on custom account names on EOS name service, uh, it seems like EOS New York is proposing uh, essentially a token ticker bidding system. And I apologize if I'm getting that incorrect, but that's sort of what it seems like to me um, based on their article where dApps could say, hey, you know, if I'm POS, I want to bid on the ability to decentralize POS amongst these block producers. And that would sort of be a funding mechanism um, for this overall system. Is that correct, Zach? Is that the way you understand yeah, it? Yeah. So think of this like the EOS name auction, except unlike the EOS name auction, which those funds go directly to the RECs, uh, which we just talked about earlier, this one will go to a common development fund or program, which will be a, a pool of funds that the block producers get to decide what it will go towards in funding. Um, so right now we, we don't know how much that amount would be, but be, there, there's so many things that require cost, which is like time for developers or contractors to in, incorporate different things on, on the main net. Uh, a big one recently was coming up with a better solution for the EOS history nodes. So if, if, if there's not a revenue, if, if revenue is not the end goal of, the, of certain types of development, but it benefits the entire ecosystem, these are the types of projects that are ripe for, for funding like this to go towards. And EOS 42 kind of led the way on this. They created something called the EOS voter bounties. And that was really cool too. I don't even know if we talked about it on here. But it was basically all of the big, the biggest proxies all came together and said, these are a couple of different items that the entire ecosystem needs, but they're kind of expensive to develop. So since we can't pay for it ourselves, we will all agree to work together and we will vote collectively amongst over 15 different proxies for any block producer who solves these problems. And I remember the, hist the history nodes was one of them. Th there were a few other ones, but... Yeah. This this is basically an incentive mechanism uh, that that'll fund things like that. So, what are your thoughts on on that and giving control of the development fund to the active block producers? I, I, I'm in favor of it personally. Yeah, I'm definitely in favor of it as long as the funds come from something like this that's opt in and not from inflation. I think we've all mm -hmm. kind of agreed that an inflationary fund to fund projects like this is not the way to go. We don't want to add another four percent inflation on top of everything. Um, but if it's coming from a voluntary means, absolutely. I think ideas like this are great, in, including the voter bounties. And there are a lot of creative ways that you can kind of, you know, use the different incentives within EOS to make stuff like this happen. And it's, it's very cool to see the community respond with so many different um, sort of creative ideas to solve these problems. The reason I think that the community should be in favor of this, and this is kind of me uh, lobbying everyone to agree with my, my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> um, the cost doesn't come out of the, the common token holder in the ecosystem. The cost comes directly from the dApps themselves. And it comes from the dApps themselves that want to have uh, their tokens controlled in the most decentralized way possible, completely out of their own control. So that's where the funds are coming from. So they're not coming from an inflation. They're not coming from the token holders themselves. They're just coming out of the winner on a daily auction for uh, these token contracts to get decentralized and permissions granted to the uh, 15 out of 21 block producers to make any changes to it. So uh, exactly. I'm, I'm excited for this. I, I think this article just came out a few hours before we recorded this. So the information will be trickling out. I'm, I'm curious to see what the general community's reaction to it is over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And, and the beauty of it, Rob, 
we, we, we just got the EUA passed, so it's not going to be that difficult to implement this. If we reach a consensus, we're seeing like a 99% approval. Um, I, I didn't look at the referendum at all to see how many block producers signaled for this, but I'd expect not too many yet since it's so new. Well, have they actually put up the uh, referendum for this? I, I think so. Um, oh, I, didn't, wow. I, have, I haven't even looked at it yet, though, but I'm, I'm, I think it was Very in cool. the, the article yeah, I, in a link. I definitely get this feeling overall that governance on EOS through the referendum system and through BPs adding you know, new features like the EUA and RACs and all these other things, it, it feels like it's ramping up. And it's a really good yeah. feeling to see you know, over the last year or so or 10 months-ish, we've sort of been figuring out a lot of these issues, figuring out how governance should work. Should we have ECAF and account recovery? Or should you know, we keep the chain immutable and secure and not susceptible to that centralized attack vector? And we've kind of figured those those things out and now it's all in motion and it's just very exciting to see. I know it's a lot of governance talk today and mm -hmm. governance, you know, could be a little less exciting sometimes to talk about than, hey, 300 million potential new users are coming through Tapa Talk on the EOS or, hey, this new EOS VC funding announcement. But a good governance structure that's uh, governed by the block producers and the token holders alike, you sitting out there watching this video holding your EOS tokens, is critical to the success of the overall network. So it's amazing that all this is being worked out and that we're able to talk about it with everybody here. So on one more note on sort of the, the governance side, or I guess more sort of password key management stuff, it looks like Block One actually released, uh, what was this, an article about a password manager? Yeah, so it's just like, kind of like uh, another, almost like a thought leadership type piece, like a, a, a hmm. piece that just gets you thinking about security more. And it, it kind of uh, was forward thinking on how we should begin thinking of security and how we should uh, basically make written passwords a thing of the past, like the dinosaurs. Right. Um, the, the way they explained it was having like custom permissions based on what you're actually trying to do. Um, they gave example of like a library card. A library card gives permissions to, to like check out library books. Or if you have a gym membership, it's, it's, it's basically to show to get into the gym. It's an access right. token. And basically, um, one, it, it's to kind of spread out your keys. Uh, so we, we talk about having like multi-authentic, the multi-sig permissions to do uh, the most important uh, of things. So maybe you keep all of your, the bulk of your tokens in what, what is like a savings account. And you could put a multi-sig on there where you need your ledger plugged in, you need like a fingerprint from your computer, and then you need like a written password that you type in. So all of these different uh, w ways to secure your own stuff. But it, it, it's still really tech heavy to, to bring someone who is not in our little circle here of, of blockchain and crypto enthusiasts to explain to them all of the, this complex stuff. <laughs> it, 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 it's not going to happen. We will not yeah. reach a mainstream adoption if that's the case. So my favorite part about this article, because I'm, I'm definitely no expert on the other stuff they talked about was how they hid in on usability because usability, first of all, scalability was the biggest thing lacking prior to EOS basically. And now scalability is being solved each and every day. So now usability is kind of one of my main focuses and it should be everyone else's focus too, because it ha everything we build from this day forward, it has to be as usable or better than what is currently available. Nobody's going to switch to a new technology because it's decentralized or because it's on a blockchain. That needs to be completely abstracted from them. So the examples under usability that Block One gave are basically saying people shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm signing a transaction with this authorization of a key for this blockchain account on this particular blockchain. They shouldn't be thinking about any of that in the same way that when you load up a website, you're not thinking, okay, I'm typing in a domain which redirects to an IP address. I hope I'm connected over SSL and using all these different things. No, you don't think of any of that. You just type in the website and it happens. So from a user's perspective, using all of these different permission management, password management, key management things, the user should just be thinking, I'm withdrawing funds from an ATM or I'm logging into my email or Dmail in this case at dmail.co, sign up for the beta. Uh, I'm liking a post on social media. I'm buying chips from a vending machine or I'm transferring 100 tokens from myself over to Zach. That's all they should be thinking about. And all the permissions, all the security concerns should sort of happen on the back end automatically for the user to make it super easy for people like my dad to come in and just do it automatically, to just send the tokens like he did today, claiming his BIOS, um, to, to just do it without thinking about all these complex security concerns. And like you said, that is crucial for, for getting us to mass adoption and onboarding the next million accounts onto EOS. So very cool to see from Block One with that you know, sort of thought leadership. 
pr props to block one. So it's like every week we're getting it released. It's either open source code, like we saw with EOS IO Labs, yeah. which you could uh, watch last week's episode or, or the week before. I'm not sure to hear about that. And I didn't put it in the notes because I forgot until just now, but they released a code update for Ricardian contracts, a, a, oh, about yeah. a new standardization. And to, to keep this brief, a Ricardian contract is basically a human readable text of an action within a contract. So th there was that hack uh, a couple months ago where there was that phishing site that looked like it was the Talo site. And then when you sign the transaction, you're basically handing over your private key to, to someone else. Um, if, if this were the case, the Ricardian contract uh, would say, I'm basically taking your private key from you when you sign this transaction. Uh, well, and essentially, I mean, it can be baked into the core code itself. So the, the transaction they were sending people was an update auth transaction, which changes your keys. But a lot of people at the time didn't know that. They just saw update auth and thought it was a piece of code and sort of hit accept. But in this case, if that was a Ricardian contract, it could say, this is changing your keys from blank to blank. And the user would go, oh, okay, I shouldn't do that. So Ricardian contracts just help in situations where there are bugs or exploits to make it clear to the user what is going to happen or what is supposed to happen when they approve a transaction. And, and with the new standardization, last thing, it makes it easy for all wallets to integrate like the, the text that would actually pop up on your screen during a transaction. By standardizing it, it makes it so that, so that all wallets could present the same like block of oh, text. Nice. It's, it's just a standardization, but it was very that's much awesome. needed. It, it's a small change, but it's actually a really big change. Definitely. That's a huge, huge change for usability, overall user experience. So that's great to see. So moving on to our next topic, I had to answer a lot of questions about you this past weekend, Rob. <laughs> what what, what happened sure. at the EOS World Expo in San Francisco? You, you promised everyone, you, you, you FOMO'd in at the last minute, and then you made a video like the night before, and then everyone at the expo was asking where you were and that they saw this video of you saying you would be there. What happened? I know. It's, it's such a bummer, and I'm so bummed that I didn't actually get to go. So Friday, I'm getting to the airport. My flight was supposed to leave at like 6.50 p.m. out of Virginia, and then I had a connection in Chicago, and then Finally, I would fly all the way over to San Francisco and get there about 12 or 1 a.m. But what happened when I got to the airport, I found out that the plane coming from Chicago to Norfolk to then take me back to Chicago was not there. It had a maintenance issue, essentially, that delayed that first flight past my connection time. So the people at the flight desk basically said, hey, you can still get on this flight to Chicago, but your flight to San Francisco will have already left by the time you get there. And they said, we might be able to get you there late Saturday, and then you could see the event on Sunday, but chances are I wasn't gonna be able to leave until Sunday and only make it for like the last few hours of the event. So with that in mind, I basically turned around at the airport desk and said, okay, I'm just not gonna go. I don't wanna get stuck in Chicago for two days and end up missing the event. So unfortunately I had to go home, but it, it just shows uh, you know, somebody made a, a comment on Twitter, hey, we need a fleet of EOS private jets. I totally agree. If we could get a, <laughs> a fleet of EOS jets, fly us all around all these different events, that would be amazing. But unfortunately, sometimes with a connection like that, even though I had 90 minutes to spare, the maintenance issue forced me uh, to miss the connection and I just wasn't able to make it. So my apologies to everybody that was there looking for me and, and giving you all these questions, Zach. But I will be at the EOS New York event in May, uh, date to be determined, but it's during blockchain week, the same week as consensus. And uh, I'm within driving distance to New York. So if my flight gets canceled for that one, I will definitely drive. But it's a long drive, 3,000 miles across the country from Virginia to San, or to San Francisco. So unfortunately couldn't be there, but huge shout out to everyone that was looking for me and tweeting at me as well. So I, I couldn't save your plane for you, Rob. I, I couldn't make your plane get there on time. But I did avert another disaster on Saturday night at the EOS oh, World yeah? Expo. So they had the expo during the day. It kind of wrapped up four or five o'clock. And then in the evening, they had this uh, like after party thing. And that, that was the event where, where Crypto Fees, another guy on YouTube, uh, and nice. his gang gang, gang. They, they did a live crypto rap about EOS and it was really fun. And That's then awesome. Brock Pierce was our surprise guest who was announced at the kind of very last minute around the same time you, you decided to come. And so it was really loud in here. It was at Starfish Mission, which is a co-working space for blockchain projects. Really cool. Um, so at this event, every, it's really loud. There's music playing Emanate, uh, which is a great project. Check that one out if, if you haven't heard of it. It's uh, a music sharing platform to keep it simple. So it was loud. 
people everywhere, great conversations going on. Uh, I'm hanging out with Peter Kay. Uh, we're, we're near the kitchen at the Starfish Mission, and there's like a little video screen, like the size of like a cell phone screen. And it looks mm. like Brock, Brock Pierce. He's wearing his like, uh, uh, his hat that he always wears, his safari, <laughs> like, I don't even know what you call those hats. He's, like you saw the him on hats. the screen? He's like, yeah, he's like, Looking like he's like knock like I don't know if I saw him knock, but he's with his whole crew of people, but they're <laughs> they're locked outside because like the door was probably only unlocked for like the beginning of the event so people could come in. Oh wow. and then it was locked during the event to like homeless people, you know, strip the wrong people couldn't come in and nobody noticed. I have no idea how long he was waiting there, but as soon as we like realized what was going on, we bolted down the steps or across the room, <laughs> down the steps. We opened up the door for Brock and all was well in the world. And Brock That's Pierce so awesome. and his, all of the people with him were, were able to arrive at the event as planned. That's great. I love that you're just like hanging around the expo and you see on a screen Brock's face and you're like, wait a minute, what? And it's the security <laughs> camera outside the door. That's so cool. And uh, Brock, I'm sorry I couldn't be on Meet the Blockers. I know we had it scheduled to, to do an interview while I was there, but obviously didn't make it. But uh, I hope we can reschedule for the future. I, I, I sadly have to apologize to Brock as well. I did not get a chance oh. to talk to Brock Pierce. I, I kept putting it off because I, I, everyone else was talking to him and everyone was also, I was like in his vicinity talking. I, I just didn't want it to be weird and like around a bunch of people. Mm. And then before I knew it, I couldn't find them and I, I missed them. So oh, sorry, damn. Brock. I I wasn't blowing you off. I really wish we could have. We, we definitely <laughs> met in a way. We definitely made eye contact. But I'm sorry yeah, I didn't say hello. That, uh, hello. <laughs> that door. I think the same thing happened with Dan at the uh, San Francisco Hackathon last year. You just got to get in there and be like, you know what? I'm going to talk to this person. <laughs> and just everybody wants to, to talk to these people. So you just got to get up there and do it. But uh, it, it's, hopefully one of these future events, maybe in June, uh, June 1st in D.C. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to do it, man. So obviously there were tons of great people at the EOS World Expo, tons of awesome people. Shout out to Crypto Fees and the Gang Gang for performing there. That's so cool to see. Um, but what else did you see? Did you see any interesting EOS projects or anything like that? So I, I met the team from EOS Studio and they're all rock stars. Um, we did a video on them a while ago. It's been blowing up. It, it's like um, an IDE. It's a visual IDE for blockchain development yeah. on EOS. Amazing tool and it was great to meet the team. I didn't realize that Obsidian Labs I hope I said that right. The team behind EO Studio, they're actually a Y Combinator like alumni team. I'm, I'm not sure if oh, the project. Oh, really? Yeah. I had no idea. Oh, wow. So th these are complete rock stars as if I didn't already yeah. think that in the first place. But having that pedigree w was super uh, impressive to learn about. But the, the biggest surprise for me, and those aren't the only cool people, like interesting people I met. I met so many people. I'll need to do it, its own video to cover them all. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'll probably have a lot of the coolest people I met on future podcasts because I don't think I nice. could give them the credit they deserve in a few minutes here. But the project that blew me away uh, because I just because I didn't know about it. I feel like I usually hear about things well before everyone else does, or at least the general public. Uh, but there was a project there called Equilibrium, and they presented on Saturday night uh, at the at this event. And um, their website, if you want to check them out, it's eosdt.com. And what they are is they're uh, um, basically collateralized loans to create uh, collateral-backed uh, stable coins. So the, the closest thing to it, and they will disagree that it's the same, uh, but it's just like MakerDAO. So about oh, a month ago. Oh, wow. Over on Ethereum, right? Yeah, but, but on EOS. So they're not the first project I've heard of doing this. We've talked about EOS USD, I, or uh, I think they may have changed their name now, but they're like an early project trying to do the same thing. They have a former MakerDAO uh, guy on their team. But this one, it's on the main net and it works today. Really? So, so for those not familiar, let, let me kind of explain what, what this allows you to do. So Typically, most people, when they think of a stable coin, they think of US dollar tether. So basically, it's just a tokenized representation of a dollar sitting in a bank somewhere. And typically, they, they have some sort of auditing agreement that they stay transparent. Maybe not with tether, but some of the other ones, especially the, um, the ones that from like Gemini dollar and Coinbase dollar, things like that. Right. But what this one does is it, it, it gives you uh, a fiat a tokenized fiat representa representation of a dollar, but it's collateral backed with EOS tokens. So what it allows you to do is you could take the EOS tokens you own and you can collateralize them to generate these 
EOS DTs, so EOS dollar tethers. So it has to be done. I, I think right now it's at 170% collateral. So what it allows you to do is you could lock up your, your EOS in a contract. I guess I'll use dollar amounts. So however many tokens it would require to um, equal $100, you would have to stake $170 worth of EOS to generate $100 worth of these collateral backed stable coins. So it's kind of like a loan system where if I'm understanding this correctly, I can basically say, hey, I have all this EOS, but I don't want to sell it. I don't want to liquidate it and, and sort of take the tax hit that comes along with that. But hey, I need some cash now. So I could take, for example, say $1,700 worth of EOS and I could get $1,000 in uh, stablecoin tokens out of it for locking that mm -hmm. up. Is that correct? Yeah. And it allows oh, okay. all kinds. You could hedge. So if you think the market's going to go down, you, you could potentially swap some of your EOS for these stable tokens. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was their team. So I, I always base a lot of trust on the team. I, I met Alex, uh, their founder and CEO at the event. He was the one who, who gave the um, presentation. And he's actually one of the co-founders of Changeli, um, which is like a shapeshift like oh, wow. service. It's a major, major service. So yeah. he himself ha has a strong pedigree. And then the rest of his team, I dug in. He's got like a former Goldman Sachs executive. He's got some heavy hitters. Um, I think their legal counsel is really strong. Um, but this, this product, it, it was just so surprising because of how fleshed out it was the first day I heard about it. And I never heard a, a peep from this com from this company or team prior to last week. And they, yeah. they have all of their contracts completely developed and open source. If you want to audit them, uh, they have a market data, smart contract, a position, smart contract, a liquidation, wow. smart contract, and a governance, smart contract. Um, That's awesome. I know people were super excited about MakerDAO on Ethereum and that was sort of like, hey, decentralized finance, we're doing it on Ethereum. So to see something that has been you know, so hugely successful on Ethereum now come to EOS in a similar form is just so cool to see and uh, really amazing. It, it'll be cool to see them sort of take the performance benefits and the low fee benefits of EOS and apply that to their platform. And if you want to be part of their governance, you got to hold your nut tokens. You got to hold your nuts. That they're, 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 nuts. Their government token is nut. <laughs> <laughs> NUT token. I forget what it stands for. But the, one of the great. coolest things about this project or, or a project like it, because I, I don't think this is going to be the last one compared to a MakerDAO, is we have on-chain governance. So hmm. what the NUT token holders are allowed to do is they're actually the ones who determine the block producers that are being voted for using the, um, the, the reserve tokens in these contracts. So uh, a lot of the EOS tokens need to stay liquid, but... I think at, at, the, at the beginning of it, they're staking 10% of all of their token reserves to be actually staked. And then those tokens could vote for block producers, for example. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it can go up from there depending on the, the risk. That's kind of why I wanted to talk about it today, because there are people who are really interested in these stable coins. I'm talking to you, Miles Snyder. I want to hear your <laughs> thoughts on this project. And uh, I cut you off. What were you about to say? Uh, I was going to say, I think what's so exciting about this, you know, you mentioned something, which is that a week ago, you had no idea that this team even existed. You had no, no. idea that a previous co-founder at Changely was coming over and building a project on EOS with these VPs from Goldman Sachs and all these other people. And I think that's a theme that we're going to see more and more of. You know, when Effect AI moved to EOS, we had no idea about it until it happened. When there are so many teams out there that are building projects on EOS or moving projects from other blockchains to EOS that we haven't heard about yet that are just sort of building in stealth mode. And as soon as they come out, just like this project, it's like, oh, wow, this is incredible that this team is actually here building on EOS, building a real product that people want to use. So just so cool to see more projects coming over to the ecosystem. Speaking of so much stuff being built on EOS, speaking of these incredible teams sort of working in stealth and then releasing these awesome products, it looks like we had an update from Liquid Apps. So if you're not familiar, Liquid Apps is this sort of second layer scalability network on top of EOS to make EOS itself even more scalable, make resources even cheaper than they already are today. And uh, Zach, you want to walk us through that update and what they actually released? Yeah. So the Tal Miscal, the CTO of Liquid Apps, he, he him, him and uh, the Benny, the CEO, they put out uh, these Telegram messages and it said, hi, everyone. Reference for new DSP services now available. We now have Oracle services, which provides oh, wow. IBC uh, with examples for communicating with the mainnet, with Talos, Meet One, Bose, Kylan Testnet, and also across chain to other blockchain IBC with examples from Ethereum, Tron, Cardano, Ripple, Bitcoin. 
So you, you could basically wow. uh, read what is happening on those chains in a, a deterministic, verifiable way to make decisions on the EOS mainnet or uh, eventually on all of these other uh, sister chains also. And they didn't stop there. Uh, random number generation, as well as web communication, cron service, which provides timers and delayed actions. Wow. Um, I think, so IBC is huge. Uh, I myself can't even wrap my mind around the potential of uh, what this means for the entire EOS uh, main net. But the random number generators is something we've needed for a very long time right on, on EOS and every blockchain. Randomized numbers are one of the hardest things to do in a smart contract on chain. And one of the reasons is because you can cheat. And then what, what a lot of applications do is they use an off-chain random number service. But what, what, what this random number generator is going to allow is um, because DSPs are all independent and you could choose how decentralized you want these services to be, you could stake from anywhere between one to, to a million uh, different DSPs offering a random number generator. And they, would, they provide the random numbers and you don't even have to trust the DSPs themselves. You could actually combine all of their numbers to create an even more random number that's generated from the random numbers. Oh, wow. This is so, so cool. I mean, it, it really seems like Liquid Apps with the DAP network, they're trying to build a toolkit essentially for developers to go out and, and say, hey, I want to pull random number generators. Oh yeah, we need an Oracle service. Oh yeah, we need IBC to pull in users from Ethereum. All these different things are kind of being built and you can kind of see the vision of the DAP network. You know, they're, they're building more and more of it. So like the ran DICE, DICE, it was one of the biggest games on EOS in the fall of 2018. It, it exploded. Yeah. Uh, gambling games are still real big. That, how do you, uh, I, I, do you know how the randomizers work currently on any of those services by chance? So I, I believe that with DICE in particular, it happens on uh, an off-chain server, but all of the results, because you can see, hey, here's how many times somebody rolled 100 and 99 and 98 all the way down to one, you can essentially verify on-chain through the smart contract that it is um, verifiably fair that you know, you're know you getting the same odds to roll any single number uh, from one to 100. But taking it to this level where you take that random number generator out of their hands and put it in the hands of somebody like a DSP or multiple DSPs and make it truly, truly random where you know, they don't have any ability to go in and, and manipulate anything, obviously you know, makes those platforms that much better. So there's other use cases. Like think of like, uh, I, I put the example in my notes here for like a loot chest. Like if you're playing a game and, and you're pulling loot from chests, how, how does the game decide which items you get? Um, right. it, if you have the same NFTs being used across multiple games, how do you know that all of the games are, are not, the other game developers aren't cheating to make uh, their loot chests give better items than the other game developers using the same like set of NFTs to make the first owner of an NFT? So, so that's right. always a, a game logic thing. And you could have shared game logic. Um, so price feeds is, is a big service. So with, with the web Oracle services, any piece of information you can get from an API on the internet, you can now get from your DSPs as soon as uh, they develop services around these new Oracle services that were just released today. Really? So if yeah. I had a, a, you know, a third party API that I wanted, I could use that from a DSP and use that as an Oracle? Yeah. You, you can oh, eat, wow. You, okay, that's pretty powerful. And you, the, the difference between that, because there are... Uh, systems in place where, where they're running the APIs themselves, like the, the DAP developer themselves are probably using their own server to call an API and get the same information. Um, and when the DSPs do it on your behalf, you're kind of giving up control of, of, of whatever that API call is. But you could also, instead of just trusting one company or one DSP, you could spread out that trust. You could decentralize it as much as you want. You could use one DSP or you could use 10 DSPs or more. Um, you could even run your own DSP to compare your results against everyone else's to, to keep yeah. everyone uh, trustless. Right. So it's re like the possibilities are endless. It's, it's kind of just blowing my mind. I, I gave another example here. Um, so you could use a weather API and you could do a raindrop or not a raindrop. I'm thinking BIOS here, which I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I, I probably put it out before <laughs> this one came out. But um, you can do an airdrop based on if it's raining in Washington, D.C. on June 1st. So if it, if it gets rainy, oh, cool. people could be rewarded with tokens. And airdrops are cheap because VRAM's cheap. Wow. Um, That's an awesome idea. I mean, one of the initial smart contract implementations on Ethereum that I, I was always a big fan of was late or delayed flight insurance. So with the example of US World Expo, if I miss my flight, I could have a smart contract know from 
you know, the API of, of Flight Tracker or some other third party service API say, oh, he did miss his flight, the connection was delayed, let's go ahead and automatically pay him out. So that, the weather airdrop idea is so cool. There, there's so much you could really build on top of this using these different plugins from the toolkit. So I'm waiting for Peter K. So did you see the announcement over the weekend? I'm sure you did. Yeah, absolutely. Huge congrats to him and uh, to you as well, right? This extends to you. Yeah, so, th so this is, I think, the first public announcement. I've told some people in secret. Um, Peter K, first let me shout out Peter K and, yeah. and give a shout out to our EOS developer courses. So if you haven't signed up yet, we have EOS developer courses coming out by the end of this month. We are really trying to wrap them up, but we want them to be as good as possible the, on day one. You can sign up for these developer tutorial courses at everythingeos.io front slash dev. Everything EOS and our sponsor Cypherglass want to give you access to the knowledge you need to build great projects on EOS IO. But there's a lot to learn. JSX, React, Node, C++, the EOS libraries for EOSJS and C++, Diffuse, Scatter.js, and more. That's why we're bringing you the Everything EOS developer courses. In the first course, which runs parallel to Block One's official online text tutorial, we're bringing you hours of video content to help you set up your development environments, learn basic concepts, code and test the smart contract, and build and deploy the front end. From zero knowledge to an app, in one course. We've got extensive code alongs and down-to-earth explanations, so I hope you'll join us this month for the first Everything EOS developer course. Oh, and one more thing about those Everything EOS developer courses, you can sign up at everythingeos.io front slash dev, uh, but we're, we're sort of experimenting with a new payment model. So we're thinking, you know, when the courses come out, you can either pay for them or, and this is just something we're testing, we want your feedback, so please let us know in the comments or in Telegram what you think about this. But we're experimenting with the idea that if I don't want to pay, if I can just log in with Scatter and verify that I voted for Cypherglass, since Cypherglass is the one funding the courses, funding everything EOS, we're the main sponsor here, uh, if I just verify that I voted for Cypherglass, I could get the courses for free. So let us know what you think about that idea. We're playing around with it now. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Tell us why in the comments or in Telegram. Uh, should you be able to vote for Cypherglass and get the courses for free, or should everybody just have to pay? Let us know. I think they should vote for Cypherglass regardless if they want to take the courses. But I, I'm in favor of that, by the way, Rob. You know that. Uh, it, was Peter's, it was Peter's idea. So this wasn't even Rob's idea. It was Peter Kay's idea. Yeah. And he, he actually, know, he's basically developed it already. He figured out how to do it. And he said, Rob, I came up with this contract. What do you think? And yeah. uh, Rob basically said, Let, let's put it to the audience and see what they think. So we really want your feedback on that. Pete is... A, a superstar as far as teaching other people how to do things, how to communicate, how to do things. And I, he, uh, the announcement was made over the weekend that Peter K is joining Liquid Apps or he has joined Liquid Apps full time to lead um, their, their developer education, basically. So all of this stuff I, I was trying to explain to you and Rob was trying to explain about these new services. Pete is going to be the guy that translates this stuff into common English so that regular people can understand it. And I can't wait because I know he's really good at it. And this is the first announcement, but I also am joining or have joined the Liquid Apps team. But I just want to reassure everyone that it will have no effect on everything EOS. I am with the every or I, I'm with both everything EOS and Liquid Apps from this day forward. And my rule there is basically what I've always been doing here. I communicate with the developer community. I, I am constantly having one-on-one uh, -on -one DM discussions with different early projects, getting giving them feedback. Rob, I know you do the same thing. So the big difference here is I'm gonna basically be learning from people like Peter and Tal Muscal. So I really, really understand this technology because it is super innovative. I haven't been this excited about a project since EOS, basically. And I'm so excited about it that I, I just need to kind of tell everyone about it. I was already doing it anyway. This is all new stuff. So whenever we did like the interview with Liquid Apps, that was basically a job interview, it turned out, for, for Pete. And oh, we, we, wow. we had no intentions of this happening. We were already talking about this new technology. Um, and it's, it's going to take EOS main that to the main, le to, to the major leagues, really to, to even fur further than we even had it now. Um, Rob, you're probably happy because it kind of, uh, how I know how you feel about those sister chains. Definitely. I'm, I've always been a fan of the mainnet at Cypherglass. We've always been mainnet first, but I think what's cool about this announcement and a huge, huge congrats sincerely to, to you and Pete on these opportunities. 
Um, what's so cool about it is it, it strengthens everything EOS as a whole. Like Zach said, he'll have an inside look into the DAP network and an inside look into so many projects that are building on EOS. So he'll be able to bring us more information for this. Pete will be able to bring us high quality courses that not only include you know, a standard EOS development toolkit, but also include things like building on liquid apps and doing free you know, VRAM airdrops and so much more on EOS. So this is really gonna strengthen our core Everything EOS team. And uh, a huge thank you to the, to the liquid apps guys for you know, noticing the talent in both Zach and in Pete and, and sort of bringing them onto your team as well. So super excited about it. And uh, I think it'll be great for all of us involved. And if you guys want to make me look good, please join the Liquid Apps Telegram channel. So I'm also <laughs> yes. there to build and grow their community because we need the community to realize that everything is better now. Everything is cheaper and more scalable now. And to get all the news, please join the Liquid Apps Telegram channel. The, the links will be on your screen and in the description. But uh, you can make me look like a good boy if you do that. Uh, do, do we have anything else, Rob, b before I uh, uh, keep making it awkward here? Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Last thing I think I'll say, um, I've been playing a new game. I don't I don't own, I mean, you get tokens for it, but the token doesn't give you profit or anything. But I don't own any part of this. I don't even know the team. Um, it's a new new app in Token Pocket called Solitaire Duel. It's Solitaire Duel on EOS. You can check it out in there. It's pretty fun. Basically, you play a game of Solitaire for a certain amount of money, and you play against a competitor. So, it, you know, if I get a, a high score of 2,000 and they get a score of 1,500, I'll win their EOS. But it's cool because you can play asynchronously, meaning that if nobody's available to play me right now, I can go ahead, play my match, you know, send my EOS, it saves the result on the blockchain. And then when somebody else comes to beat me, if they beat my high score, they'll win. If they don't, all win and the game results are, are you know coming after. So if you want, check out Solitaire Duel on Token Pocket. Again, not affiliated with them in any way. I've just been having a lot of fun playing it. So come challenge me, rob.vr on Solitaire Duel. But other than that, I think uh, that's the last thing I have. No, no, no EOS. I, we're, we're out of notes here, so we're just going to freestyle it here before we close out. Yeah. No, no EOS name service news, no Cypher Glass news this week. Uh, we got a, a lot of stuff brewing on the back end, especially with the US name service. Obviously, we just came out with USD support with PayPal. I think we might have talked about that last week. Um, we have almost, or I think maybe we just hit 25 different suffixes on ENS. So go check them out. We have some awesome ones. .co, .link, .mail for Dmail, which is coming out. And if you're watching this this weekend, the Dmail beta should already be live. And uh, if you were one, that signed up for the beta. We had thousands of people already sign up in the last couple weeks. So we're going on a first come first serve basis, but you will get in, you will get your tokens and more details are coming very, very soon or may even be out now. Uh, so join the Dmail community telegram for more info on that. But uh, lots of good stuff brewing behind the scenes. Um, that's it for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope it was very informative. It's probably the most governance we've talked about in a while. And yeah. maybe next week we'll get back into some speculation. But all facts lately, all, all, all great things happening on the ES mainnet. So until next week, I'm Zach Gall. I'm Rob Finch. And this, and this is everything, is everything EOS. EOS. Go, Go EOS. EOS. See you next week. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs>